There ought not to be teaching. What I have to say may not be taught. By being taught, it turns into something entirely different. What I need is a teacher who does not gesticulate with arms up in a pulpit or with fingers upon a podium, but a person who gesticulates with their entire personal existence, with the willingness in every danger to will to express in action precisely what one teaches. In Dogen's tradition, uh, there's a saying that when we find a teacher, our practices have completed. Teacher means which kind of life I want to live. And the teacher is a rolling model, so I want to live like that person. That is the direction. And when we find that direction, we want, we want to walk. That is almost half of the Bodhisattva path. It's very difficult. You know, there are so many teachers, or, or fake teachers. Fake teachers, yes. <laughs> it's really difficult. Yeah, unless we know what is a genuine teacher, we don't know what is a fake teacher. It's very really difficult. So I felt I was really lucky, fortunate. As a Buddhist in this country, in the United States, you know, the history of Buddhism is so short yet. So it's kind of difficult to find, to see, to judge who is, who are good teacher or not genuine teacher. Important thing is to, for young people who are interested in Buddhism, is to study the Dharma as much as possible and to meet different teachers and try to find who is the genuine teachers. Dogen tried to find a genuine teacher and he couldn't find it in Japan, so he had to go to China and he found only one good teacher. It's really important to find a good teacher. I don't want to give, leave the impression with anybody else that we create ourselves wholly, fully. We know when we're whole and full. But in most instances, I would argue that most people get where they are because they've been called to it by somebody else. And they say, Carl, I can't do that. I've never done that. I don't want your time. Yeah, I think you can. All, and, and the Catholic mind, you see, goes way, way back. For instance, uh, in the rule we live under, a sixth century document, the fourth degree of humility says, find a wisdom figure, find a spiritual guide. Sit with somebody, let them know you. Let them help you through the bumps in the road because everybody needs a companion along the way. Now that doesn't mean, um, it, it doesn't even mean a mentor. It means a companion. It means somebody who will hear you and, and re report back to you what really sounds like a, 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 a kind of depth that resonates with themselves or that they want to know more about or that they know you ought to know more about. So here, here we have then uh, a tradition that itself leaps from wisdom figure to wisdom figure. So I, I'm a young Catholic girl and I grow up in that environment and I'm suddenly face to face with the heroes of life, not the heroes of the church. Yes, the, the church uh, uh, lets you know that they own them, but that wasn't was what it was about. So many of them confronted the church itself. Catherine of Siena, you know, who just told the Pope what was wrong with him and his, and his papacy. That's no small thing. That's, that's a movement into an internal insight to which my whole life is beholden. Uh, eventually one needs some kind of a spiritual teacher or a tradition that can guide them or a spiritual director. Now, if you're in touch with the mystical traditions, if you know, for example, someone like St. John of the Cross, you understand that that experience of dryness might actually be a sign of progress. Because according to St. John of the Cross, that means that you're being invited to go deeper and that the divine is present 
but your spiritual sense is to recognize that presence haven't yet developed. And there are specific practices then that are a specific way of being that is assigned to you to develop those spiritual senses. So you see, that's why I think it's important to, to be a student of traditions, not in terms of just book knowledge, but to actually have you know, relationships with real mentors who have gone into some of those traditions and can speak uh, of their experience of yeah, what yeah. it's about. So many people feel to have a contemplative life in the world where action and contemplation can meet. So many people feel that they want to pursue their spiritual journey outside of the religious or organized religion. I support that, even as a priest. I think what I would engage with differently would be this. Even though we say that this demands serious practice, that this demands serious discernment, that you can't really do this without proper mentors, without being situated in a community, this is not an individualistic journey especially in the US, which is a very kind of individualistic country, many people still try to do it on their own. Do yourself spirituality. And that means that they really have to have good mentors, that they have to be part of a community that can invite them into this experience of learning how to be vulnerable, learning how to receive feedback. In a spiritual life, it's so easy to make mistakes. When we just rely on our inner guidance, I mean, so many things can go wrong. Inner guidance, or in a Christian tradition, what we call the guidance of the Holy Spirit is very important. But all of that is meant to be then brought into one's spiritual director, into one's community, where people can authenticate what you're receiving, or sometimes critique it. And I think that's very healthy. When I existentially express it, it is not necessary for my speaking to be audible. If you think of, of the great uh, founders of all the religions as the uh, uh, prime force of every religion, it's their experience, their extraordinary encounter with the ultimate reality that is the, the source and that constitutes the uh, future essence of the tradition. So the, the, uh, the tradition is the experience as it's handed on. Thus, in the Eastern religions, you have something that's called a lineage, and the lineage is is is, is uh, not only a teaching, but it's it's an experience that is passed on from generation to generation through some guru who is believed to have incorporated, embodied, and assimilated, or been assimilated by the the same or or similar experience to the founder, and so it's that experience, that existential contact with the original spirit that the guru has, which he received from the previous, his teacher or her teacher, and, and which has to be passed on if you're going to maintain the tradition. So you cannot rely on books or rules to transmit the tradition. They are only a context or a, or a uh, social necessity to have some body that has the container in which the tradition can be adequately passed on. God is the master teacher and every human is an apprentice. I've had quite a few Eastern mentors, in fact I rediscovered uh, the Christian tradition in a Hindu monastery. Most of my mentors have been either Hindu or Sufi, and not necessarily Buddhists. Father Bede Griffiths, uh, whom I've actually not met in person, he died before I was even able to speak English. 
I was still in my late teens when he died. But his writings have been very influential in my life. They helped me to trust that this intuition that was attracting me to contemplation is real. And he also helped me to reconcile East with West in terms of Eastern and Western spirituality and those different emphasis, how they can work together. So I've been blessed to have relationships and to receive mentorship from some of his students. People like Vandana Mataji, who was a hermit sister in India, or Brother Francis and Sister Michaela, or Angie Harvey, uh, or Brother Wayne Teasdale, or some of the other people, other people who, uh, who really carried his spirit. And both Matthew Fox and Angie Harvey have been very supportive of my work and have been real elders in my life, helping me to kind of give that dangerous permission to trust how I was experiencing God in my life. Rabbi Yehuda Fine really initiated me into what I would call the mysticism of the streets with this very wise Hasidic wisdom of being sent into some of the darkest places to look for sparks of life that were assigned to me for me to raise them up. That was a very influential relationship. There have been many, many other teachers that have just been very gracious and kind and supportive, and I would be lost without them. And I, I see those people uh, alive around us. I see them in this community. My wisdom figures are in large part walking these halls as we sit here. These women have borne the heat of the day with the scripture in one hand, the rule in the other, and the daily newspaper in front of them. And they've done it for 50, 60, 70 years. And they never ask how much they get paid, and they don't know if they've been paid. They come home, we all eat together, pray together, get up the next morning and do it again. Now that, there, there's something about that that is not everybody's model, but it is a beacon to what everybody else may be looking for. And that is a life that is simple, doesn't ask a lot, doesn't have a lot. Uh, what they do have, they've built together uh, for the sake of somebody else. It works. If there's a... If integrity means it all is integrated. It all comes from the same source and it's all going the same direction. Uh, those, are, those are my wisdom figures and, and uh, a hundred that people you've never heard of. So here I live in a house of mentors, of generations of mentors. This house was founded uh, in uh, 1956. It was founded by a monastery in Germany that was founded in 1035. And that monastery in Germany was founded by a monastery uh, in Europe that was founded in 700. And all those monasteries are still open, every one of them. The one who was founded in 700, who founded the monastery in 1035, who founded us, is still there. This whole thing is part of a huge process. Uh, I, I, there's a part of me that hesitates to use this metaphor, but maybe it's the most profound one we have at the present time. Those, um, those mountains uh, that are erupting in um, Hawaii and in uh, Guatemala, that lava that's gushing out of that is lava from thousands and thousands of years ago. There's something about this stream of lava that goes through the human condition. It is indeed what Joseph Campbell would call part of the mythos. These are the universal truths. And we, we grow up in every dimension of this search and find one another there, just the way Merton did when he went to the East. These monasteries still gush lava. It's still going, and it's all new, and it's all burning now. A religious discourse should never be abstract truth, for all understand it and yet understand nothing. 
The task of the religious discourse is to deal with this thing and that thing, with this one and that one, in order to lead all to the absolute. It has been said that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I am experiencing a new readiness to find my teacher. I may even be ready to find a community of depth or discover or reclaim a wisdom tradition. The library of the deep place is beginning to catch my attention. I am ready to awaken to the instruction of the absolute beyond the visible and the material. I am ready 